are pleased uh, to welcome Major Jason Warren, who will be discussing his new and first book, Connecticut Unscathed, Victory in the Great Narragansett War, 1675-1676. Major Warren graduated from West Point in 1999 and received his commission as a second lieutenant in the Military Police Corps. He served as a platoon leader and logistics officer with the 10th Military Police Battalion, 10th Mountain Division. Major Warren studied military history at the Ohio State University and returned to teach military history at West Point in 2009. After receiving his PhD, Major Warren was promoted to assistant professor at West Point. From 2012 to 2013, he served as a strategist and training officer for the 3rd Infantry Division in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. His research focuses on warfare in early colonial America, and he currently serves as a strategist to the U.S. Army War College. Ladies and gentlemen, Major Warren. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for the kind invitation from my WP. Um, I'd like to say thanks for my family for being here as well to support. Um, <clears throat> considering I'm a historian in a town dominated by political scientists and international re relations specialists, presenting on a topic which occurred almost 350 years ago, what could go wrong today? Um, indeed, I hope that I survived this paper as unscathed as Connecticut emerged during the conflict um, that, I'll, that I'll discuss with you. Um, I, I will employ um, a professor's approach, uh, Mike Nyberg from uh, uh, the U.S. Army War College, uh, his approach that he's laid out in a recent article for uh, Orbis, arguing that historians, while often undermining models with a finely tuned focus, should also pose questions that prove relevant. I shall attempt that today. Given the rise of ISIS and the concomitant collapse of many Iraqi security forces stationed in communities that sometimes abhor their presence, I'd like to explore a little-known conflict from the remote past which offers historical questions about this current situation. Just as the situation in Iraq and Syria is often a matter of perspective and narratives, so too was the war traditionally known as King Philip's of 1675-76 New England. Let's attempt to understand better the unique point of view of parties overlooked in the traditional narrative of this war to gain insight for today's conflict against extremists. This will require the debunking of a number of incomplete narratives, including how the war started, how it was fought, and who ultimately won. And at this point, I'd like to orient you to the uh, New England area as it existed in, um, during this time period. So you have uh, a number of different colonies. You have Massachusetts Bay Colony. You have Plymouth. Uh, Rhode, Rhode Island, which is a non-Puritan colony, which uh, plays into uh, this, uh, this war in, in a big way, not being Puritan, and Connecticut Colony, where I focus my, my research. Some of the major Native American groups, uh, the Mohegans and Pequots, the Narragansetts, which are their main enemy, the uh, Nipmucks and the Wampanoags, who start the conflict with Plymouth. Even though it was America's second bloodiest war per capita, retarding the development and expansion of an entire region of what became the United States. The Great Narragansett War has existed for 340 years without reference in catalogs, secondary sources, or historical documents. A coalition of Indians killed 600 New England soldiers and unaccounted for numbers of non-combatants. The coalition also destroyed 17 white settlements and damaged 50 more, accounting for 1,200 houses burned and 150,000 English pounds of damage, then an astronomical sum. For their part, the English and their Indian allies destroyed hostile Indian power, killing thousands, and selling many into slavery and indentured servitude. Improperly chronicled in its aftermath, Americans misremembered this conflict. And if you get the next slide. So um, you can see the the X's are destroyed towns, the circles are damaged towns. Um, so most historians have actually focused on all of this destruction in Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, and Rhode Island. I, I decided to take the opposite tact and, and look at why Connecticut emerged relatively unscathed given similar uh, Puritan culture. In fact, many of the uh, leaders in Connecticut are, are literally from the same families of the Plymouth and Mass Bay leaders. So 
the historical question that I ultimately posed was why was Connecticut different? So that's what, what we'll be discussing today. Over the course of my paper, I will explain why chroniclers and historians alike misnamed this conflict King Philip's War, and how this narrative distorted understanding. The standard narrative ignores the conflict's regional nature, downplays its leading actors, and minimizes the Indian point of view, especially of the Pequots, the closely related Mohegans, and both native groups' enemies, the Narragansetts. The account devolving from a great Narragansett war allows for a more accurate perspective of this conflict. The standard narrative described by historians since the 18th century focused on the experience of Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies, leading to the poor remembrance of the conflict. The contemporary and popular writings of William Hubbard, Increase Mather, and Benjamin Church dictated a history based on their respective colonies and those colonies' Indian enemies. If I can get to the next slide. So you can see uh, Mather on the left there, one of the uh, Puritan uh, ministers in Massachusetts Bay during the time, and to the right a sketching of uh, Benjamin Church uh, for the military in the room. Um, he's supposedly the father of ranger tactics, and he actually steals that from Connecticut, um, and some of the Connecticut officers don't get that, probably their, their just due in terms of that. So uh, two of the major players. Central to this account of the war is Metacomet, Philip to the English, son of Massasoit of Plymouth Rock fame, and the sachem of the Poconicut band of Wampanoags. Next slide, please. Um, here is uh, a picture of Philip who starts the conflict with uh, Plymouth Colony. And you can uh, see he's, he's somewhat of importance because he has a wampum belt on. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. He's all, he also has an English uh, flintlock musket. Benjamin's son, Thomas Church, exaggerated Philip's role in the war when he updated his father's diary in 1719, some 43 years after the conflict. Thomas may have been the first to coin King Philip's War, as his father's force was responsible for the sachem's death during a raid in 1676. While chroniclers focused on their home turf, none of them refer referred to the war as Philip's. Philip's warriors responded to provocations from Phil a Plymouth colony and pre precipitated the conflict in late June of 1675. Plymouth had tried and executed three of Philip's warriors for allegedly killing one of their sachem's consuls, John Sassman. Sassman had told the English that Philip was conspiring against them. Any similar instigation by the English or their Indian supporters could have sparked the war, as tensions between Indians and whites had simmered for some time over issues of land and sovereignty. Evidence suggests that Kananchet, a chief sachem of the Narragansett people, actually would have led the uprising after most of the southern New England native groups had readied for combat. Next slide, please. It's a, uh, a sketching of what uh, folks thought Cannon Chet looked like. It's uh, difficult to get some of these portraits. There just weren't that many in the 17th century. Philip was a subtle diplomat, even nearly succeeding in the winter of 1676 in bringing into the conflict native peoples from throughout the Northeast. He ultimately failed when the English allied Mohawks damaged his entreaties by raiding his diplomatic summit, where Philip sought to enlist these peoples, killing a handful of warriors during two raids. Iroquois involvement, of which the Mohawks were the easternmost native group, however, did not win the war against the hostile coalition, as many historians claim. The late winter and early spring offensive that was the deadliest phase of the war for the colonists indicate that the Mohawks only succeeded in damaging Philip's diplomatic efforts. The role of the Iroquois was important, but indecisive. As a military leader, Philip botched his combat role. He did not seriously damage Plymouth Colony during the initial violence, and the English drove him from his territory and food catches on the Mount Hope Peninsula near present-day Bristol, Rhode Island. After barely escaping from Pecasset Swamp, in which the English had besieged him, Philip led his depleted band across the flooded Taunton River. English forces and allied Mohegan Pequot Indians of Connecticut pursued Philip's band and forced battle on him, surprising his camp. At this first battle of Nipsichuk, this in English Indian contingent forced Philip to stand and fight while his non-combatants fled. In so doing, Philip lost key battle captains and other warriors. He eventually escaped again 
This time, he and his band arrived in friendly Nipmuc country in central Massachusetts Bay Colony, near present-day Worcester, with around 75 warriors, a quarter of them armed only with bows and arrows. Besides the diplomatic failure in the winter, Philip disappeared during the war until Church killed him, having been overshadowed by more capable chieftains and native groups with more warriors and resources. Yet, historians have remembered the war in his name. The King Philip's War storyline also adopted a singularly New England narrative that Whiggish historians in the 19th century found appealing. At a time of sectionalism in the United States, the story of hardy New England colonists braving the savage wilderness and the peoples within its murky confines stoked white New Englanders' Victorian conceptions of honor and duty. This plotline necessarily ignored the regional aspects of the conflict, centering exclusively on the glorious efforts of New Englanders' Puritan ancestors. Ignored in the 19th century were the 17th century efforts of Royal New England Governor Edmund Andros, who, though attempting to blunt the expansion of the heretical New Englanders, supported them against the Indians by conducting an act of diplomacy with local native groups. Andros was especially effective on Long Island and in western Connecticut, where the Algonquian people shared a common heritage with the colonist adversaries. Next slide, please. Here's a photo of uh, Edmund Andros, the royal governor of New York. I'm very jealous of his hair, by the way. That's uh, pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> the Narragansetts, who became the leading hostile group in the conflict, maintained an especially close tributary relationship with the Long Island Indians after the defeat of the Pequots in 1637, and Andros succeeded in deterring the native Long Islanders from entering the war. In what became known as the Covenant Chain, Andros also enlisted the support of the Five Nation Iroquois Confederacy, later the Six Nations, with the addition of the Tuscarora, which came up from North Carolina, into a century-long alliance. The Iroquois raided into western Massachusetts, such as the attempt on Philip's winter camp, disrupting the anti-English coalition. Although most historians exaggerate the effects of these raids, Andrews' efforts in orchestrating them were obscured <coughs> by the royal governor's support of Charles II in its attempt to rein in the Puritans. After the war, and Andros became governor of a political entity known as the Dominion of New England, and he was imprisoned in Massachusetts after William and Mary deposed Charles II's son, James II, during the Glorious Revolution. <coughs> For this reason, New England <coughs> contemporaries erased Andros' role in the war. Whiggish historians carried that erasure forward, and many historians continued to underestimate Andros. The King Philip's War plotline not only obscur obscured the role of New Yorkers, more significantly, for a true telling of its events, chroniclers and historians alike downplayed the endeavors of Connecticut and Rhode Island, thereby magnifying those of Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth. Both of the former colonies lacked a chronicler of stature, and their critical activities, in Connecticut's case decisive, have been minimized for more than three centuries. Puritans aggressively targeted Rhode Island with land grabs, viewing it as an apostate colony seeking royal protection, ignoring its recorders of the conflict as well, such as William Harris, who wrote with precision about the conflict. The Narragansetts received similar treatment. The Narragansetts entered the King Philip's Ward narrative only after the colonists and their Indian allies attacked one of the group's main villages. Prior to the colonists' arrival, the Indian people had been fighting Connecticut's Pequots over economic spoils in the Long Island Sound Basin. This feud carried on through the settlement of Plymouth in 1620 and the Pequot War of the late 1630s, in which the English, with Indian aid, destroyed the Narragansett's main rivals for whom the war was named. Connecticut's Mohegan group, led by the savvy Uncas, replaced the Pequots while dominating the surviving Pequot clans from the earlier war, as the Narragansett's main contender. Both groups carried on intermittent warfare for the next 40 years, until settling old scores once and for all in 1676. It was this rivalry, not that between Metacama and Plymouth, that set the stage for the broadening of the war. Perhaps the rivalry between closely related Indian groups represents a small-scale Sunni-Shia rivalry 
or rivalry between other sects in the Middle East that the West has not always properly understood. At first, the Narragansetts clandestinely supported Philip, though remaining technically neutral with the English. Some of the group's warriors participated in combat as Connecticut settlers observed wounded Narragansetts en route back to Rhode Island from the upper river valley. Against the colonists and their Indian allies prior to the preemptive Great Swamp Fight of 19 December 1675, this attack openly brought the powerful people into the fray. The Narragansetts contributed ten times the number of warriors that Philip's band of Wampanoags could muster and Indians respected their war leader, Kananchet, more than the Wampanoag Sachem. Kananchet successfully forayed against the English in a number of battles prior to his death at the hands of Connecticut's forces in early April 1676. His death, not the demise of Philip, was the turning point for the colonists and pro-English Indians. As it was Connecticut's and not Plymouth's or Massachusetts Bay's forces that killed Kananchet, and conducted the most successful operations during the conflict. The chroniclers minimized those events. In fact, Benjamin Church's diary, thanks to the efforts of Thomas and others, became the standard account of operations. Many now widely believe the Elder Church fathered modern ranger tactics of raids and ambushes. Church did not first employ such tactics, however, as Connecticut's forces in the earlier Pequot War derived joint Indian colonial battlefield cooperation. Benjamin was even less successful than Connecticut columns during combat. Hostile Indians ambushed Church a number of times, nearly wiping out his command, to say nothing of the other failures of Massachusetts and Plymouth's forces. Incredibly, Connecticut forces did not suffer a single setback in the entire course of the war. But as chroniclers and historians from the late 17th century minimized the role of the Narragansetts, so too did they ignore their Connecticut adversaries. Philip's narrative emerged from these historical missteps, reflecting the biases of these original chroniclers. Fueling it further, Philip's father, Massasoit, had assisted the pilgrims of Plymouth in the early 1620s. Ironically, Massasoit actually befriended the pilgrims out of a fear of the Narragansetts. European traders spread disease prior to the arrival of the pilgrims, decimating the Sachem's coastal Wampanoa clans as compared to the more inland native Rhode Islanders. Historians overly relied on the chroniclers, constructing the memory of a Philip-centric war story, and minimized the extant records of Connecticut and New York. Hence, they ultimately failed to relate the true narrative of America's second bloodiest conflict. A more thorough narrative of what I describe as the Great Narragansett War begins with a focus on the experience of southern New England's Indians prior to Massasoit's greeting the pilgrims. Far from Pacific natives undisturbed in the wilderness prior to the taint of European warfare, the Indians in the region fought over scarce resources, as historians and anthropologists in the school of Wayne Lee and Kevin McBride resp respectively demonstrate. M McBride's excavations show an 18% rate of death through combat trauma, and a quarter of those were traditional non-combatants for Indians post-combat. Invasions of entire peoples, similar, but on a smaller scale to Europeans' early migratory ancestors, conquered and compressed existing Indian groups, such as exemplified by the Delaware Indians' invasion of western Connecticut during the late Woodland period. The Pequots and Mohegans finished the domination of other Connecticut Indians. The Pequots came to control the Long Island Sound Basin in the deca decades prior to English arrival, as they were more warlike and militarily effective than the more numerous Narragansetts. Warfare against the Mohawks likely steeled Pequot tactical skills, as both groups acted to dominate the area of western Connecticut, previously conquered by the Delaware peoples. The Narragansetts lacked this critical contact with the Mohawks, and, and though they could dominate the weakened Wampanoags, they fared worse against the outnumbered but tactically dominant Pequots. It is this new world in conflict that Verrazano, Hudson, and others explored. Next slide, please. And you can see uh, the two explorers, Verrazano on the left and Hudson on the right. Fortunately for the Narragansetts, with English migration to the Connecticut River Valley in the mid-1630s, the Pequots ran afoul of their new neighbors over interests and honor, leading to the Pequot War. 
The Narragansetts, along with the Mohegans, who were closely related local tributaries to the Pequots, sought advantage at Pequot misfortune. Allying with the English, both Indian groups benefited from Pequot defeat. The rivalry over the exploding wampum trade, the shells that native groups strung together, served both Indians and whites as coin and status symbols, as well as over the fate of Pequot prisoners, led the Mohegans and Narragansetts to continue the old Connecticut-Rhode Island feud. This intermittent warfare, which also was regional as the Mohawks factored into it, involved all the native groups of southern New England and led to scares during three Anglo-Dutch wars that the nearby Dutch would also involve themselves. The standard narrative fails to connect these critical events to the outbreak of English Indian violence in 1675, an epic failure of understanding the American Indian experience. These background events were important not only because the Philip narrative considers the years between the Pequot War and 1675 as marked by peaceful coexistence, when in fact Indian conflict was exacerbating tensions between peoples, but also because the Narragansetts developed a hatred of Connecticut and its Indian allies that determined the Rhode Island natives' actions in 1675. Connecticut, and to a lesser extent Massachusetts Bay colonies, supported Uncas and his Mohegans during the endemic warfare of the 17th century and even tacitly approved of the execution of the Narragansett Grand Sage of Miantonomi in 1643, who Canon Chet later sought to avenge. Miantonomi had invaded Mohegan territory to combat Uncas's growing influence with the colonists and to disrupt his economic base. Uncas captured Miantonomi after employing a ruse on the battlefield. In an event never afterwards related, Connecticut held Miantonomi's son, Massacap, hostage during the Great Narragansett War and accused him of burning buildings in Hartford. The narrative of Philip's war treats these episodes, if it does at all, as interesting interludes to the main event of Wampanoag animosity towards Plymouth. It was Narragansett rage, stoked by Connecticut and the Mohegans, however, which led to the Narragansett's feigned neutrality in 1675, an outright hostility that nearly drove the colonial frontier back to Boston and Plymouth pro proper in 1676. And Boston actually uh, considered um, abandoning all settlements um, too far to the west of Boston. They were going to build a wall between uh, Boston proper and the rest of Massachusetts Bay. That's how effective uh, the hostile Indians' raids were. Phillips' plotline suffers from the non sequitur of the Mohegan Narragansett Connecticut feud prior to the war, while the more accurate Great Narragansett War narrative considers this rivalry the de facto causus belli. Indeed, Connecticut's actions on the battlefield and its successful defense of its logistical base at home, which provided food for the devastated New England colonies that could not harvest crops in 1675 or plant them in 1676, carried the day for the colonists. Connecticut's colonial Pequot Mohegan forces repeated raids into central and western Massachusetts, to say nothing of those that wrecked havoc in Narragansett country to the east forced the anti-English Indian coalition to its knees. These included multiple raids from southeastern Connecticut into Rhode Island, accounting for the capture of Canonchet, the destruction of the so-called Sunk Squaw Band at the Second Battle of Nip Nipsichuk, and other successful forays bringing in scalps and captives. Larger attacks into Massachusetts also pressured hostile groups, and one noteworthy assault defeated remnants of the hostile coalition on the upper Housatonic River in what is now western Massachusetts. The substance of Connecticut's success was its fair treatment of local native groups. This treatment built on the lessons learned from the earlier Pequot War, neutralized Connecticut's potential adversaries, and in most cases won them over as allies to fight the anti-English coalition. The Connecticut towns of Wethersfield, Middletown, Hartford, and Norwich even invited neighboring Indians into their confines for the security and sustenance of the biracial local community. This was a very foresighted policy given Americans' sometimes unethical treatment of ethnic groups, such as the infamous Japanese internment camps of World War II, or in the context of our Middle East comparison, perhaps Abu Ghraib. Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies acted in opposite fashion where misguided policy of oppressions even, oppression even targeted the converted praying Indians, forcibly removing them to reservations on windswept islands in Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay. Unethical treatment 
led to most of these colonies' Indian groups joining the Indian coalition and providing it with critical intelligence to target colonial settlements. This is what led to the tally of destruction in New England besides Connecticut. How many insurgents did the U.S. military create with poor prisoner treatment in the early stages of the global war on terror? Connecticut's leadership played a critical role in ensuring that local relations with American Indians remained peaceful. Governor John Winthrop, Jr., long the patron of uh, Cassa Cinnamon's revised, revived band of Pequots, warned colonial leaders against unnecessarily provoking the Narragansetts. Get the next slide. This is actually one of the earliest, the earliest portrait of a, a Native American um, in 17th century New, New England. Um, it was we, my uh, friends and I that uh, <coughs> look closely at these topics think that it's actually misnamed. It's named Ninigrit II, um, which was a no, um, of the uh, Ni Eastern Niantics, another Native group in the New England area. Um, but we think it's actually misnamed and actually portrays Cassett Cinnamon because John Winthrop Jr. actually uh, commissioned the painting and he was the patron of uh, Cassett Cinnamon. You can tell again he has a wampum belt around his, uh, around his head so he's of somewhat of, somewhat of uh, importance. Winthrop Jr.'s sons, Fitzjohn and Waite, carried on cultural exchanges that tied white and Indian communities together. Next slide. And here's a picture. On the, on the left is a picture of the young John Winthrop Jr., uh, son of Massachusetts Bay uh, Governor uh, John Winthrop Sr., the original founding of Mass Bay, and his son uh, Fitzjohn, later Governor of Connecticut, on the right. Younger colonial leaders like Captains John Mason Jr. and James Avery led Indian warriors into battle. This leadership differed markedly from those of the other Puritan colonies that segregated and roughly handled friendly Indians. Pirate Captain Samuel Mosley of Massachusetts even fed an Indian woman to his dogs, an event apparently endorsed by his cousin, Governor John Leverett, who he informed of his actions in a letter, without apparently facing punishment. Next slide, please. You'll see the governor of uh, Massachusetts, John Leverett, during this time period. As the Great Narragansett War narrative demonstrates, Massasoit and the Pilgrims supposed good-natured cooperation at Plymouth Rock did not establish New England. Rather, the, the latter cooperation, later cooperation of English and friendly Indians at the expense of hostile native groups in the wampum belts of the Long Island Sound Basin dictated permanent colonial settlement. Connecticut's Prussian Indian policy of 1675-76, predicated on the earlier Pequot War, was the key ingredient for success. The misguided narrative that chroniclers and later historians constructed should have given thanks to Connecticut and its Indian allies for saving New England. The Great Narragansett War was not the story of the good relations of Massasoit's era gone bad by Philip's generation, but rather of endemic Indian conflict during the New England epoch of 1524 to 1676, spanning Verrazano's exploration of southern New England through this conflict. Affairs in New England raised a number of historical questions about ISIS. As I've attempted to demonstrate, the Connecticut English managed an important alliance with local groups that bolstered their security and led to effective military operations. Professor Peter Monsoor in his book Surge describes a similar phenomenon a few centuries later with Sunni tribes in Anbar province. Was it only after former Iraqi Prime Minister Nori al-Maliki purged Sunnis from government and military posts that this local relationship unraveled? Or had the surge never achieved complete success? What does this indicate about the critical element of leadership in managing military affairs? John Winthrop Jr. and his Connecticut heirs were able to negotiate complex native group relationships to achieve success. Why has the United States since 9-11 often struggled to find the right political and military leaders to deal with similarly difficult circumstances? Why has it mostly failed to find suitable political and military partners from host nations? Where Connecticut identified Uncas and Cassis Cinnamon as legitimate partners with whom to foster a security relationship, the United States more recently has chosen or been forced to choose Maliki of Iraq and Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan to say nothing of the toxic relationship with South, South Vietnamese leaders during the Vietnam War. <clears throat> is the failure to manage host nation leaders and native group relationships the hallmark of U.S. strategic fiascos in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq? If the U.S. is going to win wars again in the future, some of these questions must be answered. 
Perhaps the policymakers of today can learn from their Connecticut Puritan ancestors. Thank you. I should also say that I'm only representing my views. I'd like to make Lieutenant Colonel before I get court-martialed, so <laughs> certainly not the views of the Army or the War College. So I'd be happy to take uh, questions. Perhaps it'd be easier to go back to the map slide as well. The focus here is uh, southern New England. Have you touched at all on northern New England? Because I wonder if the sources there would be more difficult to pinpoint. A friend of mine, for example, is trying to work in this area, and he indicated that the sources seem to be in French or Latin, to a large extent, based on the uh, missionaries and the, that had come over from France and were active in Canada and the northern part of, uh, of New England. Whereas I would guess that to a large extent your sources would be English as mm -hmm. well. That's right, Father. Uh, great question. I did take Latin in high school, although it's a little rusty, so it's been a while, but uh, good Catholic school. But uh, that's a great question. In fact, in, in the book I referred to, there's really uh, a series of conflicts going on here. I mean, part of it's a civil war, part of it's this rivalry in southern New England that I focus on calling it the Great Narragansett War, but there's also a northern element that you're referring to. Um, and uh, the, the Native American groups in, uh, in northern New, New England, what's now Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, were uh, predominantly called the Abenaki, and you had the Western Abenaki, the Eastern Abenaki. Um, very good fighters, and they largely supported um, uh, Philip's war efforts, sending uh, groups down into southern New England to fight alongside the hostile groups there. Um, they were also supplied by the French, but this was, a, uh, this was the period before the English-French rivalry really started to, to kick off in the New World um, because of the Stuart dynasty that were uh, mainly the Stuart kings, uh, you know, ending with James II, um, who was deposed in 1688, um, were mainly Catholic-leaning. In fact, Charles II uh, supposedly converts to Catholicism on his deathbed, as he promised the king of France. So France, New France is, at this time, is only secretly supporting um, uh, the northern uh, Indians in this affair, because they can't actually come out and, uh, and, and, and disagree with policy back in France. So this perhaps is a case of, you know, the tail wagging the dog, where the frontier is actually ahead on uh, policies that, that will happen, this rivalry between the French and English that will kick off, and not, not really be settled, actually, until 1763. There's a series <coughs> of wars that happen, and the fighting never ends in northern New England, actually, until 1763. Uh, it also, from a military perspective, has the effect of drawing off uh, scarce you know, Massachusetts Bay um, soldiers from the southern conflict to deal with the northern conflict, because uh, parts of the coastal main area were actually part of Massachusetts Bay at the time. So um, it also had that tactical and operational effect. Um, so yes, it plays in, and uh, in, in the future I'd like to explore my research, uh, go further, um, and, and look at the French sources, but I did get some of the French backstory uh, through the English records um, that they were supplying uh, arms and ammunition uh, to the Indians. Now the Indians could actually make flints and uh, fix their muskets by, uh, by this time. What they couldn't do was uh, um, they didn't have the chemical know-how to, to make gunpowder, so that was their big problem. So they're, the French and uh, what, what's left of the Dutch in New York are actually supplying powder to the, to the Native Americans. So. I hope I uh, answered your question. Hey, well, if, if I could just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, before, uh, before I forget, if I could follow up as well, in, in terms of getting, because you mentioned sources, Father, uh, it's difficult to get the, the Indian point of view. Um, obviously, no written records, so you, you usually get it only through the backstory of, uh, of the English records. But what I attempted to do was employ uh, anthropology, sort of an interdisciplinary approach. I'm certainly no expert in the field, but I, I know some experts that are um, and, and do this. I mentioned one in particular that did a lot of excavation. So I tried to tell the Indian story through uh, anthropology and archaeology to get at their uh, point of view. So sorry to be rude, Jason. No, that's okay. Just so, uh, did the fall of part of the, uh, after the Dutch, um, I guess, left uh, the transfer of power from, from uh, New York from the Dutch to the English, does mm -hmm. that have any strategic impact in sort of um, in, um, increasing the tensions that led up to this, uh, the war and 10 years later? 
Great question, and uh, really what I try to do is view this war as a regional conflict, and that's something that previous historians haven't always done because of our, you know, the parochial view on New England. So I try to tell the New York story, Andros' story, the Royalist story. So it actually, the New York story strategically um, and actually operationally affects um, the uh, Great Narragansett War before and after. In fact, if you go to the, the slide before that, please. Um, Connecticut fights the Dutch on Long Island uh, outside of South Hold. Um, these, the, the Hamptons and, and the northeast coast of Long Island at this time are actually part of Connecticut, um, which is part of a controversy with the Duke of York's charter who owns you know, Long, Long Island. Um, so the Dutch tried to reclaim it in the Third Anglo-Dutch War, um, and the battles outside of uh, South, uh, South Hold, which uh, fits John Winthrop, you saw his portrait, uh, led the colonial militia out there, uh, gave Connecticut's leaders combat experience. Even though it wasn't against Native Americans, you know, there's still uh, obviously some military, tactical, and operational ideas that bleed over from fighting a European enemy to a Native American enemy, uh, namely a lot of the administrative stuff, the mobilization, the, the supplying, and that sort of thing. So Connecticut had an advantage uh, during the war um, that the other colonies did not because they fought the Dutch uh, on Long Island. Now, after the war, as I mentioned, the biggest thing that the, because the Dutch just didn't pick up and leave. Mo uh, most of them re remained on their plantations and swore oaths of loyalty to the, to the English again. And it had gone back and forth for you know, three Anglo-Dutch wars starting in 1652. Um, so their, their main role was providing the hostile Indians with powder uh, claim, clandestinely. And they were doing that, uh, um, the map doesn't extend enough, but Fort Orange or Albany today is up in the northwest corner there. That's where they were exchanging uh, some of the powder with the, the hostile Native Americans. So they're clandestinely trying to undermine the English still to some degree. Um, but Andros does an effective job, and he has the most difficult job, I think, of all the Puritan leaders in terms of diplomacy, because he has to deal with three different Indian ethnicities. Um, so the Long Island Indians were closely related to the southern New, New England Algonquian sort of ethnic group. Um, and he, has to, he had to deal also with the Delaware along the lower Hudson River, which were mainly Delaware uh, Native Americans, although they're also Algonquian, they spoke a different language, different dialects and also the Iroquois, which were, was its own ethnicity. So Andros has to manage very carefully three different groups. And again, you know, that's a good comparison to what, uh, what, what happens today in our conflicts in, in, in the Middle East, having, to, having the neighborhood knowledge and the ability to, um, to, to understand this very complicated uh, prosaic of, or, or mo, mo, mosaic of uh, different competing actors. Yes, sir. Uh, Two-part two question. Uh, first, in the 17th century, did any of the colonial administrators or the colonists themselves speak any of the Indian languages? Yes, in fact, um, and I'll, I'll just answer one, one at a time if it's okay. Um, they actually trained uh, some of the Pur sort of the Puritan aristocrats at the time. Some of their sons were uh, specifically trained to deal with the Native Americans and learn the Native American language. So um, it's very clear in the record that uh, I, I don't know how they picked, picked these, uh, you know, t teenagers essentially when they started training them out, you know, if they demonstrated some kind of uh, language ability or, or re relationship, that, that wasn't clear in the record, but they're definitely identifying um, uh, certain agents. Uh, Wayne Lee talks about this in uh, his book Barbarian and Brothers. He calls them dip, uh, diplomatic uh, entry points, which are also very important, you know, when two peoples are dealing with each other. So the Native Americans did the same thing. They had certain trusted agents that would o o always deal with the English or the Dutch, and same thing with the English and the Dutch. They had trusted a agents that knew the language, that were trained to know the language, and knew the <coughs> local customs. But those trusted agents were from their own groups, correct? Right. In other words, not intermediaries. So the exactly. second part of my question is, <clears throat> how many um, members of the U.S. Armed Forces or uh, the civilian leadership in the Pentagon or um, in Congress or in the State Department speak really fluent uh, uh, Iraqi Arabic or Persian, or have uh, are rewarded in their careers for knowing about the tribal dynamics and the 14 centuries of 
Sunni Shia rivalry. Um, because clearly in the 17th century, people were smart enough to know they had to speak the other side's language. And you ask, why, why do we seem to have these failures? Uh, what are we doing to make ourselves smart? That's a great question. And uh, certainly, if we could answer it well, perhaps we'd you know, have more clear success. Um, so again, speaking for myself, um, I think it's uh, th there have been attempts. There's the uh, AFPAC hands, so-called AFPAC hands, which General McChrystal, I believe, started. And I think it built upon an idea from General Petraeus to create officers that specialize in, in different regional areas that the U.S. Armed Forces are involved in. They had special language training, they had special cultural training. <coughs> Uh, my, my personal experience, having been in Afghanistan, is they're not utilized enough. They're not part of the, the Army, sometimes has a you know, some, somewhat insular culture like any organization. And certain people have seats at the table. And I haven't seen, you know, in my, again, narrow experience, uh, you know, some of these AFPAC type hands have that influence that they were trained for. Because they're not part of the organic unit. They weren't infantry or armor. There's some branch sort of uh, biases that go into that. So I think the attempt has been made, but it's more of a uh, personnel management problem, getting the right people to the right places, and it's an army culture <coughs> problem. And culture is, you know, I would argue, the hardest thing to change. So until the Pentagon actually promotes uh, folks from those programs to the highest ranks, then um, you're probably not going to see a large impact, and, in, uh, in my own opinion. Speaking from my own experience uh, uh, in the Foreign Service, um, the counterintelligence side of the State Department, i.e. diplomatic security, uh, has very low status and uh, is treated with pretty much contempt by the rest of the organization. So how, uh, how does the Army treat its MPs or its uh, uh, counterintelligence officers? Do they have good career paths? Are they recognized as uh, an essential part of, of our war effort uh, or not? I mean, part of it is idiosyncratic. Uh, you know, it depends on who the commander is. Um, some commanders, you know, value that experience more than others, I would argue. But in general, if you look at who our highest ranking military leaders are, they're usually, for at least the Army side, infantry, armor, background, sometimes artillery. General O is artillery, a former artillery officer. And it's rarely military intelligence, military police, if ever. Um, you know, and there's a certain tactical focus, perhaps, that goes with that, you know, focusing still on, you know, conventional threats, maybe more so than, you know, counterinsurgency, counter... I mean, I mentioned Peter Monsoor's book, he was General uh, uh, Petraeus's XO uh, during the surge, uh, who I studied with at Ohio State, and he has a great, you know, um, story about how after the Vietnam War, the Army simply destroyed a lot of its AARs uh, from the after-action reviews. Or reports uh, from Vietnam um, that dealt with counterinsurgency because simply we were just not going to do that anymore. We were going to, and the Army shifted its fo focus to the full the gap, high con conventional, you know, intensity, which has its. I, I don't buy the idea that you know counterinsurgency is the graduate level, uh, you know, level of war. Sort of comparing everything else is like the undergrad level. Certainly, D-Day is a difficult invasion to plan. You know, uh, it's just a different kind of you know complexity. And the Army chose to ignore the lessons very adamantly, and I think that we've paid paid for that to some degree. Yes, sir. And I forget the gentleman's name, but you said that when you recognize one person as being the father of Ranger tactics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about Benjamin Church. And what specifically do you, do you mean by that? Other than is it yeah. means, or is it more? Is it deeper than that? Right. Um, well, I mentioned kind of the generic sense of raids and ambushes more so than, uh, you know, your conventional large formations that are meandering around in the woods. Um, so he had this, you know, focus on raids, tactics during the night, uh, something that we would be familiar with today as, um, you know, ranger of kind of tactics. He also, he was one of the few non-Connecticut leaders that uh, utilized uh, Native Americans from the beginning of the conflict. He just did so in lesser numbers, and they were of lesser quality. Because, you know, it, again, it's hard to get at different quality relationships between the native groups, but I believe it had to do with contact with the Mohawks. Those groups that had less contact with the Mohawks were less tactically 
uh, had less tactical w wherewithal, and those that did, and th th those that did. So he's at least employing some of these uh, these sort of ranger ideas: reconnaissance, raiding, ambushing. Uh, not really holding territory per se. Yes, sir. No. Thank you. Uh, many years ago, I wrote a book on the history of unconventional war in the United States about chasing ghosts. And I was lecturing to my class here in this room on chasing ghosts. And I said, Robert Rogers is the father of America's unconventional hi history. And the student who was a military officer said, No, it's Benjamin Church. I said, Who the hell is Benjamin Church? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I've answered that to some degree. Then. Who is Benjamin Church? And, oh, he fought in the Narragansett War. He fought in the Pequot War. I said, When was that? <laughs> I, was the, I was the author of the book, uh, uh, which was praised. And I don't know a single thing about this. That's why I'm here. I go buy a book, I'll tell you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he went on, this, book, this, this war was protracted, it covered generations, it was unconventional in, in nature. That's right. But it has been obscured by history. And that's my question. We know Custer, we know Little Bighorn, we know Nathaniel Green down in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. we know Mosby's Rangers, Geronimo. Right. But, and Pontiac suffering, but by and large, even to somebody who is a specialist like me, <laughs> I don't know if they have to think about any of these people. And I'd ask the student who been in the church was, I thought he was he founded a religion. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, uh, fill, well, fill in why some of the details. This, in why is this rather discourse. a very critical period of American history? Mm -hmm. Relatively uh, forgot. Right, and again, don't don't feel too bad, sir. Also, because uh, <laughs> Benjamin Church, bad. Benjamin Church is, uh, you know, I would argue that you know your student's point is, you know, going in the right direction, but not far enough. So oh, if you okay. want to be uh, the first sort of founder of, you know, joint Indian Amer uh, colonial tactics was uh, John Mason in uh, the Pequot War, oh. and he starts the uh, the sort of tradition. I talk about it in one of the chapters of my book. What I I consider it a symbiotic re relationship. There's different historical schools of thought out there of why the colonists are ultimately successful. One is they completely abandoned the European tactics and fought like Indians. The other is they fought more like Europeans and didn't really do much with the Indian tactics. So my argument sort of down the middle saying that both sides concentrated on what they did effectively um, and they had a symbiotic relationship that made the, their particular skills more effective. So, for instance, the Native Americans, uh, at the, the Native American allies in Connecticut would flush the Native, uh, the hostile groups out of the woods, out of difficult terrain, um, or corner them, and then the English would use sort of standard tactical um, tactics from even the, the Cromwell era uh, to to defeat them with English firepower, European firepower. So that was generally how the tactics sort of fit together. And, you know, I, th I think that uh, people weren't finding the right resources um, and not reading them closely enough from sort of a tactical view. But why, why was this story never told, the other part of your question? Um, it's actually because of this, part of it is actually the success of the hostile groups. Um, this, this uh, if you go to the next slide, um, this war is so devastating to, to New England, and if you can see, most of the other colonies are destroyed besides Connecticut, that it, it stops the westward expansion of the, of the New Englanders quite a bit. Um, you know, there are, uh, Case Western Reserve a University out in Cleveland is actually called the, it used to be the Connecticut Reserve, because Connecticut had claimed um, land all the way out on a parallel all the way to, you know, they didn't really know where, but out west. Um, and, and the New Englanders are so devastated that they're not able to actually settle a lot of these places. They've lost so many people that they can't uh, repopulate. So the you know, the New Yorkers do, the Pennsylvanians do, so part of it's, you know, pure manpower and economics. The New England, you know, economy, um, one historian says, is uh, undermined for almost 100 years uh, after this war. So that puts New England at a huge disadvantage, and I think that that's what, uh, in terms of westward expansion, vis-a-vis -vis the other colonies, and I believe that's why um, they're largely ignored in the conflict. Um, the flip side of that is, I tried to point out that, you know, during the 19th century, the sort of Whiggish historian, the, the New England flavor was, we're going to concentrate on New England and what our glorious ancestors did, but they were only talking to a New England audience. Um, so I think that that probably uh, played into it as well. So it's which narratives get out there um, and, and, and which ones, you know, and 
pure power as well, who has the most people and the better economy. Father, thank you. Obviously, I have to ask a question about religion. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> did religion play any role at all, do you think, in the establishment of a closer relationship between some of the uh, settlers and the Native Americans? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, I think the way the book that came out a few years ago, Caleb's Crossing or something like that, the focus on the uh, first uh, Native American to attend Harvard College. And one of the tie-ins had been that uh, he had been, become a Christian. And I, of course, this is a little later, but I wonder, do, do you feel that this perhaps whether with the Puritans or you know, whatever, that there would have been a, uh, a basis to this one way or another. Uh, and, and alternatively, it could have been then a conflict with the brothers. Re religion plays a, 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 ma a major uh, role. I mentioned the uh, Sassman Affair, where a converted so-called praying Indian, um, which was Philip's chief advisor of the Wampanoags, the, the group that starts the conflict with Plymouth, is murdered. Be Philip has him murdered, essentially, is what we think happened, um, because he's, they consider him an informant to the English, and part of that was he was converted to the praying Indian side. So the issue with re religion strikes at the heart of the legitimacy and sovereignty issue with uh, the Native American chiefs or sachems as they're called in New England and the greater Northeast. Um, unlike the divine sort of right absolutist monarchs that are developing during the 17th century in Europe that you know God is indirectly commanding the subordinates uh, through the king in, in, in many ways to, to do you know what, what the sovereign says is blessed, sort of blessed off upon. The Native Americans don't have that sort of authority. Um, they had it to, to lead through consensus and prowess on the battlefield many times. And uh, also there is an issue of lineage as well. They do have some sort of lineage, matrilineal um, uh, chain going on, who's going to be the sort of commander. So um, anytime an Indian was converted to Puritan Christianity, that weakened the sachem's uh, hold over his, his tribe. Um, it also put the English in a difficult position because, as in the case with Sassaman, what, what do you do when a Native American kills another Native American that's a praying Indian? What does that say towards your conver uh, conversion efforts if you don't, if you don't respond? Um, you know, it's, is, is that going to undermine other Native Americans from becoming Puritan Christians? So that actually, you could argue that religion is the main, uh, the proximate cause of the conflict in terms of the Sassaman affair. Um, uh, in terms of tactics and operations, uh, there were some converted praying Indians that gave very good intelligence to Massachusetts Bay, even though, um, as I tried to point out, that uh, only a handful of guys, because most of them are angry, they're being round, rounded up and sent on these reservations at Deer Island and Clark Island and treated poorly. So um, it was a matter of you know the, the English not taking care of their, their flock in some way that sent the praying Indians. They, they could have utilized the praying Indians on their side more had they treated them better. Um, finally, the, uh, even the allied um, uh, and neutral sort of Indian sachems viewed re, uh, Puritan Christianity very suspiciously and fought you know, to sort of downplay it for the leadership reason uh, that I said. But I also think that there's a cultural issue here. I think that there was this sense of a creeping English-European monolith and sort of huge culture that uh, is going to eventually erase the Native American culture, that they're just going to lose their way of life. And I think re religion played a large role in that, um, that fear. And uh, so Uncas and Cassis Cinnamon, the two major uh, allied Indian leaders in Connecticut, sort of refused to embrace uh, Puritan Christianity. Um, and they have an antagonist uh, re re relationship with uh, Reverend Fitch of Norwich um, because of that. So re re religion, uh, religion looms large. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so you talked about partnerships and relationships. And originally, um, <coughs> for the military aspect, um, we had deployment cycles for about 15 months. How long do you think it would take to establish real relations and do we need to change our deployment cycles? That's a great question. Um, and actually, I was, I was thinking about writing something up along those lines. So thank you for prompting me. Um, one of the advantages that the, uh, you know, the English had in this conflict is they actually lived in the area. 
so for them it wasn't a deployment, so it was easy for them or easier for them to maintain a, a relationship. You know, the family was there and and, and their, their homestead was there. So that's certainly a challenge that you know the, the military hasn't worked out. I know that uh, the Af AFPAC hands example that I that I used. Um, I know that they had multiple deployments, so they were sort of uh, deployed for six to nine months and then redeployed and then deployed again after maybe another year. So I think there's been an attempt. The problem is getting those people, in, getting them access, getting them a seat at the table. I see that more more of a problem. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much with the family situations. I don't know how much you can you can keep folks overseas. I don't know if that's a really solvable problem with the volunteer army, um, but uh, that's one of our weaknesses. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, I'm sort of intrigued by the. If I heard this correctly, it sounds like uh, you know an expanding colony runs into and then what you said was endemic Indian warfare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about the endemic Indian War? Is that all? So, how much of the history is is it was all of the case? Right, and this is sort of the new school. The old school of history was Euro uh, Europeans introduced the uh, Pacific sort of natives to uh, that never fought or you know engaged in violence until the <coughs> Europeans got here and started uh, undermining the economy, creating a fur and wampum sort of economy, and that caused the Native Americans to fight. So that's the old, that's one older explanation coming out of the social history of the uh, 60s and 70s. The new sort of postmodern cultural turn approach, or at least one of the schools, is that uh, us using more interdisciplinary science, as I tried to do with anthropology, looking at the actual you know, uh, excavations and the uh, very clear combat trauma disproves that idea in a big way. Um, and the explorer, the early explorers, you know, come under violent attack at different times. They probably deserved it, but nonetheless, the Native Americans knew how to do it. It's not something that they, you know, learned uh, out of, you know, from the Europeans. And what they're fighting over, um, low, low, birth, low birth rates, high, high mortality rates, so a lot of the Native American uh, warfare is uh, on, uh, on the idea of being ca uh, getting ca uh, captives to bring into your tribe. So um, there's a book called The Morning Wars that's worth, I believe, Dan Richter wrote it. Um, check me on that. But the uh, name of the book is The Morning Wars. And what, the, what, what it means is that the Native groups are mourning for lost uh, warriors in battle and they're going to go out and fight again to get captives from the other side. Some are uh, ritually, uh, ritually tortured. Uh, to death, which is part of sort of the Indian re, re conception of re religion, um, uh, which is kind of an interesting and you know somewhat scary. Uh, I had a couple of nightmares of reading about these, but uh, you know the English are doing some similar things too. But uh, they're um, you know they're they're fighting to gain a higher population base. They're also fighting over you know territory. Uh, um, so you're starting to get more settled agriculture in the late woodland period. Um, let, uh, so you have semi-nomadic uh, way of life for many of the northeastern Indians, where they're going to farm the same fields and then move off in the winter to, to you know, do another activity like gather or hunt, and then come back to the field. So you're getting more of that in the late woodland period. So now you have uh, territory to fight over. Um, also, there's some you know very slivers of, of anthropological evidence that uh, the Mississippi, central Mississippi, some people call it the Cahokia uh, culture collapsed. It was one of these big Aztec-like, you know, major Native American cultural um, you know, settlements. Yeah, the Mound Indians, right. Uh, that this culture that was, you know, huge and well put together like the Aztecs collapsed and that caused a lot of their tributaries to flee in all different directions. And some of them fleed east, the Delaware group I mentioned, coming into Connecticut and uh, fighting against the, uh, the southern New England Algonquians there. So um, those, I think, are the reasons why uh, they're fighting before. Um, the European arrival does accelerate the European, or the uh, economic squabbles over the fur. The fur, you know, wearing fur in Europe was all the rage, so uh, getting it out of the New World was huge, and that caused the Indians to fight more uh, to, to dominate the fur trade. And the coastal Indians would make the wampum the, with the, uh, the seashells and certain kind of seashell and trade that for the fur coming in more from the inland. And the English and the other Europeans tried to insert themselves in that relationship. Um, and it created an early uh, colonial American economy. Um, James Drake in Civil War in New England says there's a joint economy going on at this time. Um, so that's sort of the, the result of this increased economic activity.
Um, and then the problem was with that, that the English ended up demonetizing wampum in 16, by 1663. So that causes land to become more, more valuable. So now land is the only commodity that's left that the Indians really have to deal with the English. Um, and you see an acceleration of violence after that, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Thanks for digging into this and uh, kind of reminding us of this, what probably is obscure to most of us. Uh, and then also the fact that you, you said in your book you kind of hit the middle of the road between the counterinsurgency tactics and the more traditional European tactics. Can, can we expect to start to hear some of this lingo coming out from the State Department and depending on because, you know, they're always... I'd love to sell more copies of the book yeah. if I could. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to know if you've got their ear yet or not. So. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I try in my small way to, you know, have those conversations. It's not always well received, but... Uh, um, and, and the War College gives me sort of a platform, and my boss is a military historian who deals with certain issues along these lines as well. So, um, you know, we've, we have conversations with senior leaders, and um, we can certainly try to, to work more of this in there. But I don't, I don't think it's unknown, like, you know, the gentleman talking about his book on unconventional warfare. The problem is getting the culture to adopt it. I think there's plenty uh, out there written, some great stuff written on it, but if your, your culture is still sort of conventionally minded, and that only in the Army case, if, although I'm sure the Navy and Air Force have their own subculture, um, in the Army case, the, uh, you know, the infantry, armor, artillery guys are always going to be the ones that call the shots, and based on their, what I perceive as a narrow sort of tactical perspective, um, based on their previous experience. So unless they've been brought in somehow and, you know, maybe taught or, you know, did more uh, with unconventional warfare school or, or whatever, they may not be exposed to these kind of ideas, unfortunately. So, but uh, 324, the f uh, infamous uh, doctrine was just updated uh, in June of this year. So there has been a, you know, an attempt to, to make the doctrine more useful since it came out in December of 2006. But um, the question is, are people going to read it? Um, and I would say probably not enough.